This plenary is called The Value of a Vote, Reassessing Political Equality. And here to moderate the discussion is the incomparable Linda Greenhouse. For her, th <laughs> For her 30 years at the New York Times, Linda Greenhouse was the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who brought the Supreme Court and its decisions alive for America's newspaper readers. Those of us who are alarmed at the concept of a court without Linda's commentary have been delighted consumers of her every other week columns in the Times Opinionator section and her frequent contributions to the op-ed page. These recent writings pair her always clear analysis with keen judgments about the history and trajectory of the court, about the courts more generally, and about the entire American judicial and legal system. Linda is now the Joseph Goldstein Lecturer in Law at Yale Law School, and we are very fortunate that she has been a member of the Board of Directors of ACS since 2009, where she plays an extremely important role in helping us to chart our course in the future. So please join me in welcoming Linda Greenhouse. Briefly, and I think they're going to take it away because we're going to have a conversation sitting down and you all can't see. John Lewis is a hard act to follow, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had a little intro here to tell you about the value of the vote, but I mean, it's completely <laughs> superfluous. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just say that when the ACS board and staff uh, sat down some months ago to figure out what should be the opening plenary, uh, here of this uh, convention, there was really no doubt, it was instant recognition that uh, the struggles of the right to vote within the past election cycle and le leading up to it uh, really mandate uh, progressive organization to, uh, to just have a, a, a full-ranging, thoughtful discussion across all these topics. Uh, you know, not so long ago, uh, following the struggles that John Lewis uh, lived through and, and, and led, you know, it seemed we had sort of a settlement. I mean, we had the Voting Rights Act. Uh, this is the 20th anniversary of the National Voter Registration Act. That's Motor Voter that uh, led to the registration of some millions of people. But today that progress has been stalled just in terms of sheer registration. Uh, the organization Demos put out a very good study of what's happening with Motor Voter a couple weeks ago uh, that showed that in the highest economic quintile of the country, uh, registration rates are over 90 percent, but in the lowest quintile, it's barely 50 percent. So there's obviously a lot of work to do just in getting people registered, let alone uh, the long lines at the polls, the shenanigans that were going on in the last election cycle, uh, voter ID, uh, purging of voter rolls, uh, telling volunteer organizations that they risked uh, prosecution if they help people vote, uh, to speak nothing of partisan disenfranchisement. In, uh, in 2012, many of you know this, I think, uh, Democrats got uh, 1.4 million more votes in elections for the House of Representatives than Republicans, and yet the Republicans control the House by a margin of 234 to 201, so something is going on there uh, that needs some discussion. We're going to talk about uh, all of these things, uh, but before I introduce our panelists, I have some moderator instructions here. Okay, notes for moderator. Uh, CLE, okay. Uh, this session has been approved for CLE credit. All those interested in obtaining credit should sign in out there. Uh, please advise the attendees that if they do not sign in, they will not receive credit. Okay, you're advised. Uh, <laughs> and you are asked to submit a completed evaluation form and pick up a certificate of attendance at the CLE table at the end of the panel discussion, and that end will be at 1115. Um, okay, we have note cards at your seats. So please write any questions on the note cards and they will be picked up. And we will save the last 20 minutes or so of our time uh, for Q&A. Turn off your cell phones.
and turn off your cell phones. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So um, I will very briefly introduce the folks on the panel. They're not sitting in the order um, in which they'll speak, but you can read their name tags. And I'm going to introduce them really briefly. Their bios are in your materials. But one thing to emphasize is that all of them, including uh, people whose day job is teaching in law schools, uh, have hands-on litigation experience uh, in the voting rights area. Uh, all of them do, and that's what makes them such valuable participants. So first, uh, Ryan Haygood, Ryan, where are you? Ryan Haygood, um, <coughs> is director of the political participation group at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He was involved in the last iteration of the voting rights uh, struggle uh, today at Shelby County. Four years ago, it was the Namudno case and he's done a lot of other uh, voting rights litigation as well. Uh, then we're going <clears> to, <throat> I'll turn next to Rick Pildes from NYU Law School, where he is the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law. And in 2008 and 2012, he was a senior legal advisor to the Obama campaign uh, and was involved in the litigation in Ohio to uh, reopen early voting uh, before the, the, the weekend before the election. Uh, <clears throat> Then I'll turn to Nina Perales, Vice President of Litigation for MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense Fund. Uh, she litigated uh, brilliantly the LULAC case, the Texas Voting Rights Act case a few years ago and talking before the, and I heard that argument, uh, talking before the panel. She shocked me by telling me it was her first appellate argument of her life mm -hmm. and she won the case. <laughs> so um, next I'll turn to Steve Shapiro who is the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union. He's argued many cases before the Supreme Court. And uh, Pam Carlin from Stanford Law School, uh, who's also argued many cases before the Supreme Court. She's the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford. So that's who, we're, that's who we have. And let me sit down so we can get rid of this podium so that this side of the room can see us. So as I said, I'm going to turn to Ryan first uh, to talk about the Voting Rights Act case, the Shelby County case uh, that, as you heard from Congressman Lewis, is going to be decided within the next 10 days, one assumes. Uh, what's at stake there, and why does it matter? Sure. Uh, thanks, Linda. I really want to uh, thank ACS, and in particular, LaShawn Warren, for the invitation to be here. It's a great honor to be invited to participate in this panel, particularly given the the lineup, these are folks who are doing uh, important work uh, in this area. And I also just want to recognize very briefly a longtime mentor of mine in the past, LDF President, Director, and Counsel Ted Shaw, who's in the audience. He uh, mentored me as an intern at LDF. Uh, he allowed me at that time to carry his bags, uh, literally. <laughs> and uh, I, I also got an opportunity to learn about what it means to practice civil rights law at the highest level. And I just wanted to quickly say I talked to a few law students last night. I came to LDF by way of the LDF Freed Frank Fellowship. It's a four-year fellowship where you spend two years working at a firm called Freed Frank in New York City and the second part of the fellowship at LDF. And I encourage law students, uh, one, to consider strongly interning at the Legal Defense Fund, and two, this fellowship. It's a fantastic opportunity to do the kind of work that I do about which we are very passionate. Uh, so this case is Shelby County versus Holder. Uh, folks here likely know that Shelby County involves a provision of the Voting Rights Act, which is Section 5. It's referred to as the heart of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Section 5 applies to all or part of 15 states that have long history of, discri of discrimination in voting, and it requires these jurisdictions to submit all of their voting changes to the Department of Justice or to a federal court here in D.C. before they can take effect. And the theory is that these jurisdictions are places where voting discrimination historically has been most intense, most entrenched, and over time has been most persistent and adaptive. Uh, the Voting Rights Act is really a truth teller in the sense that it tells us both about sort of where we've been historically and where we're going in the future. The idea is that the history informs the present. And I want to situate my remarks in this important historical context. I so love that uh, Congressman Lewis uh, gave the introductory uh, remarks because it's important for us to think about the Voting Rights Act historically and its importance in the modern day. 
In the last several years, we really saw an assault on our voting rights that was historic, both in terms of its scope and in terms of its intensity. And Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act really helped to stem the tide of that proliferation of voter suppression tactics. So we saw, for example, in Texas that Section 5 beat back a discriminatory photo ID measure and a discriminatory, discriminatory redistricting scheme. We saw in South Carolina, Section 5 beat back a, a discriminatory photo ID measure. Section 5 actually ultimately changed the photo ID measure that South Carolina sought to implement. In Florida, Section 5 beat back that state's attempt to scale back drastically the early voting period, which was an important channel through which African-American voters participated in historic numbers in the 2008 presidential election. More broadly, um, in the past reauthorization period, Section 5 uh, beat back more than 1,000 proposed discriminatory changes. Had these changes gone into effect, millions of minority voters in the places covered by the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, would have been discriminated against. It's really important as folks think about the Shelby County case to think about the record that Congressman Lewis and other members of Congress assembled in 2006 when they considered whether to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act for another 25 years. They did their homework. They held many, many hearings, heard from more than 90 witnesses of all sorts, and assembled a, a record of 15,000 pages that spoke to, yes, progress having been made in the context of voting, but yes, the need for more progress. So for example, if you were to look at this record, you'd find, uh, you'd find the record is replete with examples of jurisdictions attempting, attempting to make voting difficult for minority voters. In Alaska, for example, very recently, um, there was, a, there was a proposed change to move a polling place from a native Alaskan community, right? It was in the heart of a native Alaskan community to move this polling place 70 miles away to an area that could only be accessed by boat or by plane. This was a real voting change, which would really have affected minority voters in Alaska, and the Department of Justice rejected this change. In the city of Kilmichael, Mississippi, for example, in 2001, the 2000 census reflected that African-American, African-Americans had become the majority of the city and for the first time were poised to elect some members to their city council. They had not had any African-Americans in the city council in the history of the city of Kilmichael, Mississippi. The 2000 census showed that African-Americans had become a majority and they were poised to elect perhaps several members to the city council, maybe even a mayor. There, the good people of Kilmichael, Mississippi decided instead to simply cancel the election. The Department of Justice said, actually, that's a voting change that would harm minority voters. You must have the election. And guess what happens in the election? The good people of Kilmichael, Mississippi, elect several members to the city council and an African-American mayor. But what I think is most striking about this particular challenge, and there have been more challenges to the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act in the past two years than there have been in the previous 46 years of its existence. We've seen these constitutional challenges coupled with the vo proliferation of voter suppression tactics. And what's striking about this particular challenge is that it comes to us from Alabama, which folks here recognize as the state which has some of the worst conditions, which ultimately gave birth to the Voting Rights Act. And history here is important, because if you look at Alabama and the other uh, jurisdictions covered by Section 5, there is a direct line of discrimination going back to slavery and reconstruction in Alabama up through the Bloody Sunday March and the subsequent enactment of the Voting Rights Act, up through this important line of cases called the Dillard line of cases, I'll talk about those quickly, Dillard line of cases, and up into Shelby County. In the past reauthorization period, which was 1982 to 2006, there was an important line of cases called the Dillard line of cases, which Pam litigated while she was at LDF. And in these cases, a federal district court found that Alabama had for more than a century used at-large voting to intentionally dilute the voting strength of African Americans. In the end, the Dillard cases required that these jurisdictions abandon at-large voting and adopt, in many of them, district voting, including in the city of Calera, which is in Shelby County, Alabama. In the 1980s, the city of Calera in Shelby County, Alabama adopted district voting and they had, including one district that was a majority black district. For 20 years in the city of Calera, there was an African-American elected to the city council out of this district that was majority black until 2008. In 2008, the city of Calera uh, submitted to the Department of Justice a redistricting plan that reduced the black population 
in the majority black district from 70 percent to just under 30 percent. So from 70 percent to 29 percent and submitted this plan to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice rejected this plan under Section 5, finding that it would be harmful to minority voters in this district, obviously. But the city of Calera was undeterred. In 2008, the city of Calera nevertheless held an election using this, un, this rejected, this illegal redistricting plan. And what do folks here think happened to our hero, the sole African American on the city council? He lost badly. He went from being the top vote getter in the previous election to the lowest vote getter in this illegal election. Under Section 5, however, the city of Calera in Shelby County, which is the source of this particular challenge, Alabama, was required to redraw its electoral boundaries fairly and under Section 5 hold another election in which the African Americans in this district were able to elect their candidate of choice who happened to be the African-American who had served there for the previous term, only the second African-American to hold this office in the history of the city. And the point is this, that when talking about the Voting Rights Act, it is incredibly important to situate the historic struggle for voting rights in this country. You cannot talk about the Voting Rights Act starting today. And so we've heard a lot, particularly from the court in the last two oral arguments, about why is it that the Voting Rights Act focuses unfairly, some have characterized it, on these mainly southern states. Isn't it true, as we saw from the last election, that there have been problems in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio and Wisconsin? Why not update the Voting Rights Act? And the reality is this, as we saw in the last election, the type of discrimination that exists in the places covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is of a different character altogether. It is more intense. It's more adaptive, as we saw in this example I provided from Alabama, with a straight line from the Dillard cases to the most recent attempt in Calera to circumvent voting rights for minority voters. And it's more adaptive and more persistent. It's not to say that discrimination doesn't happen in places outside of the Section 5 covered jurisdictions, because it does. But as you saw in the last election, some combination of state law, see Wisconsin, see Ohio, see Pennsylvania, and perhaps federal law, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, was enough to quell those discriminatory voting measures. But in the places covered by Section 5, where discrimination over time and into the present has been of a different character altogether, Congress has to have the authority to proscribe a stronger, to borrow from Pam Carlin, a stronger medicine, a stronger um, prescription for voting discrimination, which has been Section 5. So and that's I, what's important here. I want to open this up <coughs> sure. to comments by others, but, I, but your intro uh, raises, I want to make a couple of points. You mentioned the South Carolina voter ID case. So that was a case where it never actually had to go to Section 5 litigation, right? Because when the Justice Department pushed back after the submission, South Carolina changed, you know, conceded, basically. Rewrote the voter ID, right? So, so the, I think, uh, tell me if I'm right, that when, when people say, uh, you know, there haven't been that many challenges under Section 5 these days, uh, they don't all go all the way. The jury, the, it has a deterrent effect by just being on sure. the books. Is that right? Sure. So there is an important deterrent effect to Section 5, but it's also true that sometimes these jurisdictions persist. And so the South Carolina example, they submitted their change to the Department of Justice for, uh, for approval, and they ultimately uh, pursued this change in the, in the federal district court here in D.C. And what's fascinating about the South Carolina example is that the photo ID measure that South Carolina initially sought permission to implement was ultimately changed over the course of a trial. South Carolina ultimately implemented a photo ID measure that included uh, what they call a reasonable impediment uh, exception, which really swallows up, in our view, swallows up the rule. So if you don't have the proposed photo ID that they're requiring, you can provide what's called a reasonable impediment. I had to work. I couldn't find child care to get it. I have financial constraints. And that is sufficient to allow you to vote without providing the photo ID measure. So this is a new, to, to your point, uh, Linda, this is an important way that Section 5 operates both to deter jurisdictions from doing bad acts, but also in the Section 5 process, there is a vetting process that makes plain the, the issues, the issues, the, the voting changes at issue, and can ultimately discourage jurisdictions from staying the course that they initially charted and out. And speaking of Shelby County, so as, as we learned in Namudno uh, four years ago, uh, there's a bailout provision in the Voting Rights Act. So if a covered jurisdiction 
has a clean record for 10 years, they can apply to bail out and get out of coverage. And obviously, that cannot apply because of the history that you just recounted uh, to Shelby County. Shelby County is an odd county to have been the, right. have chosen to litigate this. And of course, uh, we know that Shelby County didn't wake up in the morning right. and said, let's bring a challenge to the voting rights act. They were recruited, right. uh, carefully picked uh, by the same team that picked uh, the Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District mm -hmm. in the Moodno, uh, and having failed there, uh, decided to, to keep on going because of the signals that the that the court sent, and, and Chief Justice Roberts' famous line from the, the Moodno opinion, things have changed in the South. But let me turn to Rick, uh, who's uh, done a lot of work on the Voting Rights Act and may have some provocative thoughts about the coverage that we currently live under. Okay. So, so first of all, let me say that, uh, like Ryan, I, too, am very uh, honored and, and flattered to be included uh, in this uh, discussion and also to be able to speak uh, in the aftermath of one of the great heroes of 20th century American uh, democracy, John uh, Lewis. Um, and I, I have called the Voting Rights Act a sacred symbol of American democracy for exactly the reasons that John Lewis so powerfully uh, expressed and manifests manifest in his person. The, the fact that the act was born out of the blood and the bodies, uh, as John Lewis put it, not just of those in Selma in 1965, but those who fought for decades and decades since the end of Reconstruction uh, to ensure full, inclusive um, democracy in the United States. Uh, but when laws become sacred symbols, uh, it also becomes very, very difficult to have discussions about how laws created initially 50 years ago are best adapted to the circumstances of today, um, including to reflect a variety of you know, very significant changes that have indeed taken place since 1965. And if I can contribute anything to this discussion, I think it's to you know, express a caution about uh, getting too much inside an echo chamber that's insulated, uh, in which uh, the same kind of concerns and the same stories and the same moments uh, are constantly discussed and rediscussed within a group that already shares very common perspectives. Uh, at least if you want to be successful in the strategic context of litigation or in politics, you know, it's always been my view that you have to understand as best you can uh, where your, uh, not obdurate opponents are coming from, but the kind of good faith center um, who may share a lot of your values and purposes but have concerns that you may not share. Uh, and um, I was very, very troubled during the reauthorization process for Section 5 in 2006 when I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee that there was no effort made in Congress to do anything at all to signal in some way that Section 5 was being updated since Congress had last examined it in 1982 and since its original enactment. Uh, in a way that would put the statute in the best possible position in the inevitable constitutional litigation that was going to follow. Uh, I don't think it's any surprise uh, that these cases arose. I think uh, everybody understood in 2006 we were in a very different constitutional environment than we had been in in 1982, let alone in 1965. Rick, let me interrupt, and, and we yeah. should probably just lay out for people that haven't intensely followed this issue, what is the constitutional argument? Just say a little about city of Bernie and congressional authority. Because well, that's all come up since the last time the court has upheld the act against constitutional challenges, I think, three times in the past. But as you say, since then, it's a new constitutional right. landscape. So, so What's unique about Section 5 is that we've never had a federal statute that singles out particular parts of the country for unique control by the federal government, a form of what 
you can call federal receivership in a sense with respect to any changes in their voting systems. Because what Section 5 requires is that before any change in anything related to voting in the covered areas takes place, it must be submitted to Washington for approval, and without that approval, the change cannot go into effect. Uh, and the statute was first upheld in 1965 after its original enactment as a five-year measure. Uh, the court talked about the, uh, dr you know, the drastic, uh, drastic circumstances of massive dis disenfranchisement that existed on the eve of the Voting Rights Act enactment. It was reenacted as a temporary five-year measure again. It was then reenacted for seven years again. And in 1982, it was reenacted for 25 years. And when the reauthorization came up in 2006, this was the first time Congress was examining Section 5 since a number of things had changed. For example, a greater willingness of white voters to vote for black candidates in the South, at least in some parts of the South, the rise of, or the end of the Democratic Party's monopoly on political power in the South, so the Democratic Party could no longer ignore black voters as it could for several decades after 1965. Uh, the intense competition and pressure the Democratic Party in the South was coming under from the Republican Party. Uh, and many of those of us who had studied this as a policy matter for years uh, assumed, at least I did, that at least some changes would be made to the statute in 2006. Uh, but in fact, there were no changes made with respect to things like how easy it was to bail out from the statute, because bailout had just not turned out to work in the way in which Congress envisioned it. Um, that was the way the Voting Rights Act was going to get updated over time, naturally. Um, but bailout has been a tiny, tiny piece of what's gone on with the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Congress didn't re-examine which parts of the country should remain covered and which not. As Ryan said, the coverage formula essentially goes back to 1965, uh, with some modest updates from the 1970s. Uh, and so constitutional doctrine in the intervening years, for 20-some years now, uh, had imposed various constraints that hadn't existed before on the use of race in public policy making settings, uh, on Congress's powers under the 14th and 15th or the 14th Amendment to enforce that amendment, uh, on C Congress's enumerated powers more generally. Uh, and so uh, the court has obviously become increasingly concerned to just, that the Congress provide evidence to justify uh, a unique statute that singles out some parts of the country rather than others under various doctrines that have been developing over 20 years. Now, the thing that troubled me the most in 2006 was that Congress didn't really examine evidence, and I think there was a deliberate decision not to open up this question. Congress didn't really examine evidence about how much the covered jurisdictions remain significantly different from the non-covered jurisdictions. Maybe some of the covered states had improved significantly. Maybe some non-covered states needed to be included, as Ryan said. Uh, and Congress didn't uh, update the bailout formula, and Congress reenacted the system for 25 years. So symbolically, in my view, symbolically, what this represents to the Supreme Court and to Justice Kennedy in particular, who I think of as the center of the court on these issues, the decisive person on these issues most likely. I, I think symbolically this represented Congress's uh, failure to update the statute in, in any way that signaled a recognition that certain things had changed. It's not obvious, obviously not everything has changed. Obviously we don't live in some post-racial era just because President Obama has been elected twice. Uh, but certainly things, some things have changed. Uh, and Congress didn't reflect that in 2006, and I think in part because of this echo chamber insulated kind of effect in which uh, there wasn't a serious effort to speak to Justice Kennedy 
in my view, at the time the statute was simply reauthorized in the form that it had through all these years. Let, let me invite other people to weigh in on the vote. We're going to turn to other aspects of our voting question, but while the Voting Rights Act is on the table here, invite. Well, let, let, let me just talk for, for a second about what I think the possible options are for the Supreme Court. Um, because there are four that I can think of, but I, I suspect the other panelists can think of, 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 of others. Um, one possibility, and until the Supreme Court says otherwise, I continue to hope this will be the result, because you can't do this work without being hopeful, um, is that the Supreme Court will do what it has done, as Linda said, on three previous occasions and uphold the constitutionality of, of, of the Voting Rights Act. And while it may be true, as Rick said, that there are um, things that Congress might have considered and included in the legislative history of the 2006 reauthorization that it didn't. It is also true um, that this is one of the most extensive legislative records that Congress has ever compiled uh, in support of a, uh, of a civil rights law. So they could just say, it's fine. They could also construe the challenge by Shelby County as an as-applied challenge as opposed to a facial challenge. Linda referred to this. And they could then say whatever problems may exist uh, uh, if and when the government applies the voting Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act to other jurisdictions, uh, Shelby County is a repeat and persistent offender, and they have no claim uh, that the preclearance requirement is unconstitutional as to them. We will leave other questions for another day. Um, Justice Sotomayor asked some questions along those lines during oral arguments. So either of those two outcomes uh, would wind up uh, upholding the Voting Rights Act, at least for the time being. Uh, the third possibility, uh, the third and fourth possibilities, are the court could strike down the Voting Rights Act. And they could strike it down because they could simply say, uh, Congress has no authority under the 14th Amendment to impose a preclearance requirement at all. Um, Justice Kennedy is, at several points, raised the question or raised the proposition that every state is entitled to equal sovereignty to single certain states out uh, for this sort of preclearance requirement violates one of the basic premises of our federalist system. And so the whole notion, it may have made sense in 1965, but we live in a different world today. Um, and then the whole concept of preclearance would, would be gone. Um, I actually think that's not a likely outcome. I think it would require the court to somehow pretend that problems of race discrimination, and in particular race discrimination in voting, uh, are, are gone, that our country has passed them, that they're an historic relic. I think it's going to be hard for the court to say that with a straight face. And Justice Kennedy in particular has acknowledged in other contexts that the country remains a country that is struggling with race discrimination. So if the court is going to strike down the Voting Rights Act, I think the most likely way to do it um, along the line, the most likely way that they will do it along the lines that Rick has suggested is to uh, go after the coverage formula uh, and to say the coverage formula as it exists today is substantially the coverage formula that was adopted in 1965. Whatever else you think, conditions in the country have changed, um, and the static coverage formula is no longer, in the language of the Supreme Court, congruent and proportional to the problem. Um, if the court goes down that road, and I hope they do not, uh, I think the important uh, takeaway there is that's not the end of the game, as John Lewis says. That just puts it all back in Congress's hands. And one thing to note about the Voting Rights Act and the reauthorization in 1996 uh, is that the vote in the Senate was 97 to nothing, I believe. Um, nothing happens in the Senate by a vote of 97 to nothing except the confirmation of Sri Srinivansan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And the, and the vote in the House was 380 to 43, I believe, and it was signed into law by, uh, by, I, by President Bush. Um, and I think it is incumbent upon all of us um, to somehow resummon the bipartisan spirit that led to the enactment of the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in, in, in 2006 and go back to Congress and say, um, this is not the end of the story. It's just the beginning of a new chapter. Problems persist. Uh, you need to address them. Uh, and to the extent that the court identifies flaws in the 2006 reauthorization, you need to um, correct them. 
So, so I, um, in the best of all possible worlds, we're going to get a decision in the next two weeks that says the Voting Rights Act stands as is and is constitutional. Uh, but if that's not the decision, I just think it's a call to action. It's not a, uh, a call for despair. And that's where I think we're going to be in two weeks. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the getting rid of the coverage formula. That's the tack that Judge Williams took in dissent on the D.C. Circuit when the D.C. Circuit upheld uh, the act in, in Shelby County. And, you know, not to be too cynical about this, but it strikes me that this would be a perfect route for the Roberts Court to take uh, because they could in that way kill the Voting Rights Act hands off, right? Because, yes, it goes back to Congress, but, again, I don't mean to be overly cynical, but look at Congress. So, uh, Do I have to? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although on that point, I would just add, you know, it's not the Voting Rights Act constitutionality has been challenged every time that it was reauthorized. So this, but the Supreme Court has upheld the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act four times over four decades. So this is really to the point that the Voting Rights Act is entirely consistent or upholding it against this challenge is consistent with the Supreme Court's own precedent. And you know, I just I wanted to sort of take issue with this idea that the Voting Rights Act is meaningful only as a symbol of it. I think that that view reflects one's proximity to the harm. Yeah. If you ask voters of color in jurisdictions covered by Section 5 whether we've uh, arrived at a place where it's no longer needed in those jurisdictions, they would tell you that we absolutely haven't. They would, re they would re remark that we've made progress but not enough that we no longer need Section 5. So, for example, LDF represents, in the Shelby County case, uh, African Americans who live in the county, who, uh, one of whom refers to Section 5 as a light switch. And he says what Section 5 does is it illuminates, it turns on the lights and illuminates those practices that are being implemented by, or attempted to be implemented by my jurisdiction. And look, if there's no harm in, in the practice, then the DOJ or the a federal court approves it. But if there is, then it puts the burden on the jurisdiction to prove that it's not discriminatory. And so I think we really have to resist this idea that what the Voting Rights Act is really is sort of a historical symbol, like the Congressman John Lewis, like his, like what he did on the Edmund Pettus Bridge when he got his, literally got his cranium cracked in 1965 was like a moment in time from which we've traveled a great distance but no longer need to think about. The reality is, that Congress did a lot of what was discussed in 2006. It did consider the way in which voting discrimination is of a different character in the existing jurisdictions. There's an important study that's part of the congressional record that looks at Section 2. Section 2 was another provision of the Voting Rights Act which applies nationally. So Section 5 is essentially like a shield and it says you can't implement this voting change jurisdiction until it's approved by the federal uh, government. But Section 2 was more like a sword and it lets you strike out at discriminatory voting uh, schemes or uh, uh, measures that are in effect. But you, the plaintiff, have the burden there. But you have the burden. It's a very expensive process, uh, which Nina knows full well, having done these throughout Texas. But this study looked at the, the number of successful Section 2 cases where courts found that jurisdictions sought to implement discriminatory voting changes that were ultimately struck down as harmful to minority voters. Section 2 applies nationwide. So it's an important metric to, dis, to, dis, to identify those places where voting discrimination is most prevalent. The jurisdictions covered by Section 5 comprise only 25 percent of the entire U.S. population, right? You, the Section 5 jurisdictions, 25 percent of the whole population, but they accounted for better than 80 percent of those places where there were successful Section 2 cases. So this idea that Congress has reauthorized without thinking about the whole nation the Voting Rights Act in 2006 is actually not supported by the record before it. And that's why there is reason for great hope that the Supreme Court will stay the course, consistent with its own jurisprudence, recognizing the, 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 the record before it, spanning 15,000 pages, and the reality that Section 5 now is doing important work for voters of color, millions of them, in the existing covered jurisdictions, and uphold the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act against this particular challenge. Pam, you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to back up one step from this and say it seems to me that there are two things that have changed since 1965 and perhaps really three. One of them is obviously the nature of discrimination and even to be completely candid, the degree of discrimination in voting. That has changed since 1965. 
Another thing that's changed since 1965 is the composition of the Supreme Court, and with it, the jurisprudence about who decides these issues. So if you think about uh, Section 5, think about the problem uh, using the following kind of metaphor. Suppose you had um, some people who had really high blood pressure, and you gave them a drug that lowered their blood pressure. And then you said, well, we don't see any difference between the people with high blood pressure and the people with low blood pressure, so they can stop taking the medicine. The question is, who decides whether you stop taking the medicine? Who's the doctor? Uh, and I think when it comes to the Voting Rights Act, that's part of the critical question. Because the Constitution, if you actually read the text, says that the 15th Amendment, which prohibits discrimination in voting on account of race, and the 14th Amendment are supposed to be enforced by Congress through appropriate legislation. And so a lot of what's changed since 1965 is the degree of respect that the Supreme Court gives to congressional judgments about how to attain equality uh, and liberty and the franchise. Uh, and when you come back to me later, I'll talk about a little bit about what, what I think we can be doing about that. But I do think it's important to recognize there are two changes here. Uh, one is things have gotten better with respect to voting. And the other is that things have gotten more difficult with respect to congressional vindication uh, of rights in front of, the, in front of the Supreme Court. Nina, I want to give you a chance to respond to this and then to move on to some of the issues that you've been involved with and other forms of voter suppression. Thank you very much, Linda. I'd like to say thank you to ACS, not just for including me on this wonderful panel, but for really making a home for me and, and for being so welcoming uh, of speakers from Maldef. Uh, thank you to Caroline. Thank you to LaShawn. Brian, you stole my thank you to LaShawn, but it is just as heartfelt. Uh, I really appreciate being here. So to pick up the thread, I really think that Congress did go through a process of updating and thinking hard about the coverage of Section 5 in 2006. That's why Congress built the extraordinary record that it did with the assistance of the civil rights community coordinated by the wonderful Julie Fernandez who at the time was at the leadership conference. It's one of the high points of my career to have been able to participate even on the periphery of that. Uh, it was amazing and what Congress did was really bring its vision to the ground. I agree with Ryan when he says that your feelings about the coverage formula are very much related to your proximity to the harm. I think Congress looked at real jurisdictions and real people, which is why the record is over, I believe, 17,000 pages long. I think when Congress made the decision to continue the coverage formula, perhaps from some people's perspective, that meant that it was stale. Uh, I think from the perspective of those who are affected by these policies, it was exactly the right thing to do. And I'll circle back around to some things that are happening in the state where I live in Texas that I think proves that point. I also think that when a jurisdiction doesn't take advantage of bailout, that doesn't mean that bailout isn't working. Sometimes, and we heard some of this testimony in the MUD case, because we call it the MUD in Texas, the Northwest Austin Municipal mm -hmm. Utility District number one, uh, there was testimony in the MUD case that some of the jurisdictions actually appreciated being covered by Section 5 because it allowed those you know, lawyers in the jurisdiction to advise their elected officials not to undertake certain course of action because it would be discriminatory and so it served a useful purpose. So circling back around, I'm so glad that we're crisscrossing back and forth between the past and the present and the future because that's always really where we start our perspective as well from the Latino community. You know, we find ourselves in an interesting position right now we're still struggling to overcome the legacy of past discrimination, the white primaries, the poll taxes, violence at the polls, refusal to register by local officials, uh, or in, in states in, in where we live, such as Texas, where you have to be deputized to assist others to register to vote, the refusal to deputize Latinos or to provide them with the forms that they need to complete in order to assist others to register to vote. And yet today, despite our participation gap, which still lingers, our numbers are increasing and our participation is increasing. And we see vote suppression increasing as a response to that. 
So uh, I think it's an, an extraordinary and interesting place to be in. What we see today is old poison in new bottles, that famous phrase from Justice Souter in the Bossier Parish case. So we used to have restriction on voter registration. We have it today in the case uh, that's pending right now before the Supreme Court in which we're challenging the additional documentation requirements for voter registration in Arizona. We brought that case on behalf of Mr. Gonzalez, who tried to register to vote the day he took the oath of citizenship in a naturalization ceremony in Yuma, Arizona. He was promptly rejected for voter registration after providing the number of his certificate of naturalization as requested by Arizona because he didn't give them the documentation that that state law required. He was rejected a second time when he tried to register to vote using his driver's license, again requested as part of the proof under the Arizona law because when he took out his driver's license, he was a legal permanent resident immigrant and had subsequently become a citizen. So Arizona's restriction on voter registration, which during the discovery period on the case resulted in the rejection of over 31,000 500 voter registrants in Arizona is a direct challenge to the National Voter Registration Act and the gains that we won, which said that anybody anywhere in the United States could register to vote using a simple postcard and wouldn't have to provide additional documentation requirements. That we, case has gotten kind of lost in, in you know, public <laughs> attention. It's the other voting rights case. The other case. voting rights case, which is also going to come down in the next two weeks. Yes. So, the one so, that will come up first, I would say. Okay. Uh, so, who knows? So what, I mean, this, it's a preemption case on a certain level, but what, what are the implications mm -hmm. of that? Well, in Arizona cloaked its additional documentation requirements in, of course, a very strong anti-immigrant rhetoric, being Arizona. This was one of the first laws that kicked off <laughs> Arizona's current spasm of, of uh, anti-latest <laughs> spasm, right? For, for those of us who do, uh, do uh, uh, litigation under immigrants' rights, we know that Arizona is famous in the past for that as well. Um, but it is... It is um, it is much bigger than that in the sense that if Arizona is allowed to require you to attach things or enclose things with your voter registration form to prove your eligibility as a United States citizen, there's nothing to start, stop another state from asking you to attach documentation proving your residence, like a utility bill, so they know what precinct to put you in or to attach documentation to prove how old you are to make sure you're old enough to vote, or to attach documentation to prove you're sane or that you're not encumbered by a felony conviction. So this, I mean, it's not just about proof of citizenship, as I guess that was certainly the way that they got enough votes to pass it as a state initiative, but I believe that it opens the door to really undermining the progress that we've made in voter registration under NVRA and in general in state laws allowing you to register by swearing to your eligibility as opposed to having to prove documents to prove it. But it's not the only thing that states are doing to restrict registration as back in the old days, we have new restrictions in Texas on what deputy registrars can do. Those are the people who help other people register to vote. I cannot help somebody else register to vote unless I'm deputized. But Texas is passing new laws to restrict your ability to become deputized or your ability to work once you are a deputy. So now there's a training requirement so in order to become a deputy registrar, you've got to go to training, but the counties don't offer the training all that often. And if you're deputized in Bear County, which is where I live in San Antonio, I can't help somebody register to vote in Atascosa County, which is neighboring, because I'm not deputized in Atascosa County. And you'd have to get deputized in 254 counties in Texas to be able to assist statewide. So you can see how this would be, uh, and train, right? Because you've got to do the training everywhere, too. So uh, what is old is new again, right? And, of course, redistricting, uh, which we've been involved in and which you can talk about forever. But bottom line, slicing and dicing the minority population, especially the fast-growing Latino population in certain states. The most intense litigation has been in Texas over Texas redistricting. Strong Latino growth. Texas picks up four seats in Congress. The lines are drawn. No new Latino districts. The lines are drawn for state house. Fewer Latino districts than we had before. You have to be a really good map drawer <laughs> to subtract the number of Latino opportunity districts in the state house plan. 
in Texas. And these are Section 2 cases for the most part, right? Well, the Texas redistricting was Section 2 case and a Section 5 case, which is why people expressed some confusion about what's going on. But we basically had a two-track litigation challenging the plans in Texas under Section 2, 14th and 15th Amendment. And then Texas goes to the DDC to try to get preclearance under Section 5, which it did not get either. That case is on appeal. That's all I'm going to say about redistricting. But I also wanted to touch quickly on states' efforts to purge the voter rolls of non-citizens, which generally involves, for example, in Florida and Colorado, sending letters to thousands of naturalized citizens demanding that they reprove up their eligibility to vote based again on out-of-date driver's license records, and then having that winnowed down, thank goodness for the press, having that winnowed down to like the four people who accidentally registered and, and that turning into nothing at all. And then finally, the strict photo voter ID laws. And the only thing I would say about that is Section 5 has played such a critical role, not only in South Carolina, but we represented a pair of sisters, 18 years old, the pride of our community, graduating at the top of their class from a charter high school in San Antonio, full scholarship to go to college at St. Mary's University. Wonderful, wonderful girls. They turned 18. They registered to vote but they didn't have the ID required by Texas under its new photo voter ID law. We brought them to Washington, D.C., uh, and one of them testified before the DDC in the preclearance case, and that you actually can board a plane without a photo ID, mm -hmm. but in Texas you wouldn't be able to vote without a photo ID. And, uh, and luckily, the DDC agreed and has also blocked the photo voter ID law in Texas under Section 5. So the last thing I would just say is that you can look at all of this through various lenses. You could say it's about a state. This is about Ohio, or this is about Nevada, or this is about fill-in-the-blank toss-up state. You could see it as being about D or R, which I can assure you it isn't, having met enough political operatives from both parties who don't give a fig about electing the <laughs> Latino candidate of choice. And you could say maybe this is about a presidential candidate, or this is about a year. But it isn't about any of that for us. It's broader, it's deeper, it stretches back into the past, and it reaches forward into the future. Um, so I want to thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to just present some of that to you today. So just to clarify, or maybe enlighten, one point about voter ID that I think confuses some people. So back a few years ago, the Supreme Court rejected a facial challenge to the country's first voter ID law, which was in Indiana. That was the Crawford case. And so some people say, well, you know, the Supreme Court upheld voter ID in Indiana, and it's, uh, you know, Section 5 is making voter ID in Texas problematic and illegal. So what's the deal? And as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Texas voter ID law was much more restrictive and less forgiving than the Indiana law. So it's like two separate laws, right? Yes, and two separate challenges as well. The Crawford was a case that involved a different kind of barrier, one based on cost more directly. And in Texas, the question is whether it has a, a racial impact and whether it takes minority voters backwards. But the DDC did note that the Texas law is much stricter than the Indiana law and also noted that in order to get the free ID that is purportedly available in Texas, you have to go down, even if you have the underlying documents, which are more expensive in Texas than they are in Indiana, you'd have to go down to the motor vehicles office. Eighty counties in Texas do not have a motor vehicles office, and most of the others are only open because of budget cuts nine to five Monday through Friday. So if you are a regular person with a regular job, it's very difficult to get the purportedly free ID in Texas. So those are some of the differences between Texas and also, Indiana. If, if, if I could, Linda, Indiana it was a constitutional challenge, and which we lost because we were just trying to clear away the constitutional underbrush so that Nina could bring the Voting Rights Act case. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Steve. <laughs> Nicely done. So uh, turning to you, uh, I'm going to spare you campaign finance. I don't think that actually fits into our discussion, so you're going to thank me for that. But, uh, but I do want to uh, give you a chance to talk about uh, the, the partisan gerrymander issue that I think is you know, under the radar for, for in, in many conversations about what's going on with voter rights, but is extremely salient going forward. 
Uh, well, thank, thank you, Linda, and, and, and I agree with you about both things, that it's a little bit under the radar and that it is uh, extremely salient going forward. And it involves less the denial of the right to vote than, the, uh, in some ways, the dilution of the right, right to vote. And it is made possible by um, uh, many of the same technological advances. There's always been partisan gerrymandering, but it's become much more sophisticated uh, through the development of new computer software, which is also what enables uh, racial uh, gerrymandering to take place and what enables the NSA to listen in on your conversations. Um, and, um, but I think it's, it's an extraordinarily serious, serious problem. And in preparation for this panel, I, 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 I went to uh, Nate Silver, because where else would you go? Um, <laughs> and and, and, and some of the statistics um, are, are the following. In 1992, about 25% of all congressional districts were deemed competitive. By 2012, that number was down to 8%. The projection is that in 2014, that number will be down to 5%. Uh, in 2012, roughly two-thirds of all congressional elections uh, were decided by more than 20 percent margins. They were landslides. Uh, and as Linda said at the beginning, in the 2012 congressional elections, Democrats outpolled uh, Republicans nationwide by 1.1 million votes, and Republicans won 33 more seats, a majority of 33 in the House of Representatives. This is not a partisan uh, issue. If the Democrats have uh, power over the State House, they elect to engage in political gerrymandering, and the Republicans do likewise. Uh, when they have control, one of the things that happened um, over the last couple of election cycles in anticipation of the 2010 redistricting is that the Republicans put an enormous amount of money in State House elections precisely so they could control uh, the redistricting process in, in, 2000, um, in 2010, and we are reaping the consequences of that and will now um, for the next, next decade. Um, the issue has been to the United States Supreme Court three times. Three times the United States Supreme Court has uh, refused to address it, um, uh, largely because it could not figure out what the appropriate rule would be because the Supreme Court begins with the premise that you can't take politics out of uh, redistricting, but that there is some such a thing as too much politics, and they can't figure out where the line is between an appropriate amount of politics and too much politics. Um, so the issue would have been foreclosed entirely in federal court, I think, uh, as a non-justiciable political question, but for Justice Kennedy, who keeps holding out the day, uh, holding out for the day that he and we will figure it out, um, but that day hasn't, hasn't arrived yet. Uh, there has not been much litigation at the state court level, uh, and I think there will be more as we go forward under state constitutions, that that's a fertile area of potential future um, uh, future litigation, but we did see a major development uh, in California when California, through its initiative process, took redistricting out of the state legislature and gave it to an independent, nonpartisan commission, which had previously been the rule in Iowa but nowhere else, and California was obviously um, a big step forward. And from my perspective, I think what we saw was a much fairer redistricting process in California um, than we would have seen if it were, if it were left to the to the politicians. Uh, and if the government is going to run elections as the government must inevitably run elections, I think the rule has to be, as it is in all other First Amendment contexts, that the government has to be a neutral referee. And if the government is a neutral referee, it means it can't tilt um, the scale in favor of one political party or another, just as it can't tilt the scales in favor of one racial group over another. Uh, and we, the increased, um, uh, uh, use and sophisticated use of political gerrymandering has left us in a position where in addition to distorting the political outcome of, of, of elections nationwide, uh, we have a situation in which for many people running for Congress now, the primary becomes more important than the general election because the general election is a done deal and primaries are hyper-partisan events and so you get hyper-partisan candidates getting elected to Congress and that contributes to the gridlock that we now all witness on a daily basis up on Capitol Hill. So I think just in any discussion of impediments to equal participation in the political process, Process and the fair uh, and efficient functioning of our democratic system, in addition to these extraordinarily important questions surrounding the Voting Rights Act, uh, we need to think about the political gerrymandering issue as well. So California is really a kind of natural science experiment for us to watch and see, see how that plays out. 
Yeah, and, and you know, what happens is the result is in the eyes of the beholder, and, and people tend to look at it through partisan lenses as well. But I think if you look at it through sort of a political science lens, uh, I think it's hard to avoid the uh, conclusion that what came out of California this year was just a lot more objective and a lot fairer. Uh, and, and, you know, whoever wins a majority in a, in, in a fair democratic fight deserves to control the political process, but you shouldn't get to rig the rules, and that's what's now going on. Can I, can I just... Uh, Comment. So I, I agree with Steve that it, it's a shockingly kind of pathological system we have, which no other democracy has, in which existing office holders have the power to design their own election districts. And surprise, surprise, when they use that power to protect their seats or to protect their, their partisan allies, um, to maximize their advantage. Um, I've been amazed that you know, it's been so hard to get people to see that. Uh, I've talked about this for many, many years, and it's, it's, it's remarkable to me how many Americans think it's, they don't trust an independent commission about anything these days. So they say, well, of course they're not going to really be independent. And there's this idea that at least our elected officials are people we can control and vote out of office. But it's completely perverse to think that when it comes to these issues. But, but at the same time, I think you know, we all have a tendency to wish we could make our system better with certain simple fixes, like getting districting out of the hands of politicians. We should do it. It would help. But it's also true that compared to these earlier decades, the country has sorted itself out geographically. And, and people are much more located in places with other people who vote similarly to them politically. Liberals are in the urban areas. Conservatives are in the rural areas. And so there's a lot of data that if you look at presidential elections at the county level, counties don't change. But today it's the case that the number of counties won with more than 60% of the vote by one candidate or the other is vastly larger than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And that's not about gerrymandering. So there are two things going on. There's this sorting by geography that's a very real phenomenon. And there's this pathological districting system, which we should change for any number of reasons, but not out of a belief that it's a panacea for the kinds of you know, polarization problems uh, and the like that, that Steve has talked about. Of course, if there's any state in the country that's really on the cusp of change, Nina, I think it's yours. I think it's Texas. And I just wonder whether you have any <laughs> thoughts about how, how this kind of thing sorts out there. I mean, you've got, you've got Houston with, you know, an elected out lesbian mayor. Uh, who, and I, when I met her, I said, how did this happen? And she said, well, <laughs> we're, we're a blue dot in a red state, but maybe there's more blue dots? Sure. We have an elected out lesbian sheriff in Dallas County. Um, so for whatever that's worth. Um, and then we, have, then we have a lot of, you know, other elected officials. Um, we appreciate the attention. I think it's very nice that, um, that folks are saying we're on the cusp of, of things. Uh, I enjoy having a front row seat to the efforts to kind of make it happen, uh, to make Texas a more competitive state. I'm, um, I'm watching and seeing sort of money coming in and leaders coming in and waiting to see also how all of that is going to integrate itself with the ongoing efforts by the Latino community to organize itself and increase its own political participation. And so we'll see if, um, now see, I've been in the South long enough to have to restrain myself from referring to carpetbaggers, but in the... <laughs> In thinking about all of this as sort of a genuine effort to, to bring resources and to bring energy to our state, I think the jury is still out on, on questions of race within that effort, I guess mm -hmm. is the best way to put it. Pam, you had very nicely volunteered to, um, to wrap us up by giving us a way forward if, if things not so good happen in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you have ideas about constructive ways to respond? I do. <laughs> A phrase that I'm hoping to use in more than one context sometimes. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, so, uh, Linda kicked off this panel by saying that um, John Lewis is a hard act to follow. Uh, and I want to say it would be a harder act not to follow John Lewis. Because when you see John Lewis and you think about his life, one of the things that I always think is, given what he's done, how can we not do what we can do? Um, and uh, one of the things that John Lewis uh, often says, um, echoing Maimonides, I think, uh, or Hillel, is, if not us, who? If not now, when? And I want to add a third line to this, which is, if not this way, how? Uh, and I want to take the long view, um, because, of course, this is... Uh, this year is the anniversary, uh, 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, uh, and of course Congressman Lewis is the only still surviving speaker uh, from that march. And it's humbling to think of the fact that he was younger than I think everybody in this room, including those of you who've only just finished your first year of law school, when he did more to make the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendments a reality than all of the people who put those words into the Constitution and all of the courts that have enforced them since. Uh, so I want to talk about two uh, provisions of the Constitution that haven't yet been given their full, uh, their full power as a place we might think of moving forward, uh, and then to say something else about uh, taking a long view. The, the two provisions of the Constitution I want to talk about very briefly are Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution, and Article 4, Section 4. Uh, Article 1, Section 4 is the provision that says that uh, the states have the power to set the time, place, and manner for electing senators and members of the House of Representatives, but that Congress may at any time make or alter uh, those regulations. In the past, the Supreme Court has viewed the so-called Elections Clause as giving Congress plenary power over all elections at which members of Congress are being selected. Uh, and this allowed Congress, for example, to go after vote fraud in elections for sheriff in Louisiana in the United States against classic case. It's allowed Congress to set uh, an, a, a nationwide election day. Uh, and we learned in the first round of enforcement of the motor voter law, the NVRA, that it allows Congress essentially uh, to get the state, induce the states to change their election practices even for state and local elections because it turned out it was too expensive for states to have different rules for registering people for state and local elections than for national elections. So that if Congress, and this is why I think Nina's case, the uh, uh, Arizona against Gonzalez case is so critical because it says that if Congress wants to make it easy for people to vote, uh, in federal elections, that will make it easier for people to vote in state and local elections as well. And so I think we need to be thinking about what kind of legislation we want uh, Congress to enact using the Elections Clause. The second provision that I mentioned is Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, which is the Republican form of government clause. And this is Republican with a small r, uh, not a large r. And it essentially says that the United States should guarantee to all states a Republican form of government. Uh, now, the Constitution doesn't say what a Republican form of government is, but I think we can infer a lot about what it's not. It's not an oligarchy. It's not a kleptocracy. It's not a monarchy. <laughs> uh, it's not an inherited uh, government. It's not an aristocracy. And so one of the things I think we need to think about is how can Congress use its powers under the Guarantee Clause uh, to guarantee that states have systems in which the people rule, in which to go back to a version uh, of Rick's point, we can say rather than the elected representatives going into a booth every 10 years and selecting us, we go into a booth every two or four or six years and select them. Uh, now, do I think either of these things is going to happen in the very short run? No, I don't, because of the Congress we have. Uh, but this is why I think having John Lewis kick off our discussion today is so important, because we have to build a movement. Uh, if you go back to the speech that John Lewis planned to give at the March on Washington, rather than the speech that ultimately they persuaded him uh, to give, <laughs> 
Uh, one of the things he said there is you cannot rely on Congress and you cannot rely on the courts alone. You have to rely on people in the streets. And that's one of the things that I think we have to take away from whatever happens in the next couple of weeks, which is the movements in the courts are a product of movements in the street. If what we see in the next two weeks is uh, defeat of uh, laws and policies that were designed for racial justice, at the same time we see the triumph of claims for equality for LGBT people, one of the lessons to take away from that is changes in the streets and changes in the boardrooms and changes in conversations people had and not just politicians made those changes in the courts. And so I think we have to begin rebuilding a movement that will, uh, in the words of Justice Felix Frankfurter, sear the conscience of the people's representatives. And you do not sear that conscience by remaining silent. You sear that conscience by being loud and making good trouble. And so I take away that we have to think about building a third reconstruction, just as people like John Lewis built a second reconstruction, while we resist any attempts for a second redemption. Because if you think about time and long changes, and you think back to 1965, and you say, well, 2013 is a long time after that, it's important to remember what we looked like in 1913, which after all was just as long after 1865 as 2013 is after 1965. We had 80% turnout in the presidential elections in the 1880s by black men. We had more turnout by black men in elections in the 1880s than we have today. And that went away because we weren't vigilant about it. And so we need to be vigilant about defending the gains we have and about thinking in the long term about how we build strategies. We build the intellectual capital to make arguments from the elections clause and the guarantee clause so that we have the tools in place the next time we have a Supreme Court that has been induced to listen. Thank you. Okay. There have been question cards around. Um, if people have collected them, did anybody bring them up? I wasn't looking. They're supposed to hand them to me when they get here, and then I'm supposed to hand them to you. Okay, so we can. But they do haven't handed well. them to me. I'm well, not suppressing the cards. <laughs> Rick, did you have? Well, the, I want to link what Pam said to the message I was trying to convey in my remarks. Believe it or not. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, John Lewis talked about moving forward. And I have also said, in the way that Pam, uh, similar to Pam here, that uh, we have to be thinking about general universal laws that protect access to the ballot box. And one of my concerns, uh, if the Supreme Court strikes down Section 5, and by the way, I don't predict outcomes. I leave that to Jeff Tubin. Um, since he seems to be making a career of getting them wrong. Um, but, uh, but if that does happen, you know, one of the concerns I have is that there will be a tremendous rush among the progressive legal community to try to figure out, figure out a way to tinker with Section 5 and stay within that general approach to protecting the right to vote. And I think that that's a mistake because I think there's much more power in the elections clause uh, than in the civil rights model from the 1960s era. So I agree with Pam. I think that's a creative, imaginative way to be looking forward. And, and I do just want to say one thing in response to Ryan. I don't, did not say the Voting Rights Act is of only symbolic significance. I said it's a sacred symbol. And I am concerned that precisely because we are not able to adapt it because of this symbolic importance, it gets put in much greater jeopardy. So there are absolutely things going on that need to be addressed. I'm concerned that the failure to be more 
forward-looking in 2006 is going to make it more difficult for the act to continue to play that role. But we have to think about new ways not stay with the status quo of the past to protect the right to vote. I'd like to, oh, oh. I would just like to make a quick point, which is that I agree, and that's why we're litigating a case under the NVRA in which 80% of the people rejected for voter registration were white. Right? Um, but I, and, and I do believe in the broad approach, but I also think we can't lose sight of the pernicious mm -hmm. and persistent racial discrimination that underlies our elections, not just racially polarized voting, but attempts to thwart the vote because of race. And I, was, I have to share, I've been feeling a little low this week because although I think my team is doing fairly well, go Spurs go for all of you. <laughs> um, we had, when the games, when the finals moved over to San Antonio, we had a, a young man, he's 11 years old, uh, sing the national anthem at the game. And he participated in uh, America's Got Talent a young mariachi, and he sang the uh, national anthem in mariachi style and all dressed up. And the flood of commentary on Twitter it was just so discouraging. If anybody hasn't looked this up, I really urge you to do that as your homework assignment. Uh, I think that, it, that at our peril, we ignore the persistent uh, feelings in this nation that people have towards Latinos and other people of color. And I think we have to keep that at the core of any work we do including working on the kinds of broad remedies that, that we've been discussing. Okay, I'll turn to, we have some good questions here. Do you think the bail-in the bail in provision would be, avail and would be a viable alternative mechanism if the coverage formula is struck down? Who would like to explain for us the bail-in provision? Me? Yeah. Because all I'm going to say is stay tuned. What? <laughs> you do so section, section three of the Voting Rights Act um, has a provision in it that basically says that a court that finds constitutional violations, violations of the 14th or 15th Amendments, can essentially require, can retain jurisdiction over a case and essentially require preclearance by that jurisdiction in the future of its changes. Uh, and this provision's been used a couple of times. Um, I worked on a case in Arkansas where actually the uh, district court in Arkansas found that Arkansas had so often used uh, majority vote requirements or the requirement of a runoff in which uh, a minority candidate who finished first in the second round would be defeated, first in the first round would be defeated in the second round, that they used this so often in a racially discriminatory way that Arkansas would have to get preclearance in the future if it ever wanted to use one of these again. And so if, as Steve hypothesizes, one of the ways the court uh, decides the Shelby County case is to leave preclearance as an institution in place, but to get rid of the formula, the question then becomes, can, can uh, civil rights lawyers use Section 3 to bail in jurisdictions? Uh, and the answer is, they can. It's a more complex process. And it doesn't have, uh, because there have been so few of these cases so far, it doesn't have the kind of tracks laid down that make it easy and obvious. And so there will be a lot of questions to be answered and the like. Um, you know, if you go back to South Carolina against Katzenbach, which was the case where the Supreme Court first upholds, upheld Section 5, one of the things that Chief Justice Warren said there is that the point of Section 5 was to transfer the advantages of time and inertia from the perpetrators of discrimination to its victims. Um, and Section 3 does not do that because it puts the burden on the civil rights community to get people back into the position where Section 5 transfers the burden, uh, transfers the advantages of time and inertia. So it is a partial opportunity, but it is not a kind of universal solution. I don't know what other folks on the Although I, I, I would that. say, Linda, that one possible fix if we lose Shelby is to expand the bail-in provision so that it is available not only for constitutional violations, but it's available for Section 2 violations at the discretion of the court for some you know, limited period of time. You violate Section 2, which is an impact st effect standard. For the next 10 years, you have to submit you know, any voting changes uh, for preclearance. That, that, I think, is a possibility and something that people will probably explore if Section 5 goes down. Interesting. But I would I just echo what Pam said for the reasons that she articulated that 
the bail-in provision would not be a good substitute for Section 5. But the question did bring to mind something we didn't address fully, which is the bail-out provision that exists uh, in the Voting Rights Act. Now, bail-out is an option uh, that jurisdictions who have what we like to think of as a clean bill of health for the last 10 years can avail themselves of, or they've not been bad actors over time. So very recently, New Hampshire uh, bailed out from coverage becoming the, one of the places that uh, was released from coverage altogether. Uh, Alabama, in Pinson, I think Pinson, the city of Pinson in Alabama recently bailed out after showing that for the last 10 years it had not had any uh, objections or any other voting problems. So there are opportunities where jurisdictions can show they've had a clean bill of, bill of health over time, can bail out from Section 5's coverage. Can you talk a bit about the Presidential Commission on Election Reform what you expect it to accomplish and how ACS members can get involved. So this is a commission that was set up a few months ago by President Obama and it's headed by uh, probably the leading Democratic election lawyer, Bob Bauer, and the leading uh, Republican election lawyer, Ben Ginsburg. And they're supposed to come up with recommendations for how to make things better. So is there anybody who's been involved in this at all? Um, so, because this is a bipartisan commission intentionally, because in order to get legislation through, uh, you obviously, you know, these days need a substantial amount of bipartisan consensus, um, it will not, I assume, tackle the more controversial issues, like voter identification laws, for example. Mm -hmm. But, because it's focused on the absurd length of these lines that some people had to suffer in Virginia and Florida in particular and that we litigated about all weekend and the day of the election, um, that actually is a very significant window into problems in general with the voting system. So even though it starts off with a, a relatively narrow focus, we've got to fix that, that being the long lines. That's what President Obama said. Um, and even though the more controversial issues won't be on the agenda, once you start looking into why these lines are ridiculously long in some places, you get into issues about how antiquated our voter registration system is, all the mistakes that arise when people show up and they're not on the rolls and they're eligible to vote. That pushes into the direction of modernizing the voter registration system, making it easier for people to register, easier for people to stay registered when they move on resources for the election system so that we have people monitoring the polls, machinery and the like that are relatively modern, like uh, in a business sort of sector. And that's why they put CEOs from important companies like Disney and others um, on this commission to try to figure out how to, the government can make voting more like some of the best provided services at, large volumes that you know the private sector does for <coughs> consumers. So I don't expect the big issues, but I, I think there's a real potential that a lot, by, by starting to get into the teeth of the election administration system, there can be some very significant recommendations that come out to make the system work better for the average voter. Well, that's a good point. I mean, people may not realize just how, uh, for one thing, how how localized these issues are and how sketchy they are. Um, back when I was living in Montgomery County, I took training and became an election judge in Montgomery County. And, and uh, you know, voters had, if, if you moved, you had X number of months, or I forget what it was now, to change your registration. So I was working the provisional ballot table. And this sorry stream of people were sent over to me. And I would say, what's your problem? And they said, well, you know, I, I moved and I didn't. I said, well, how long ago did you move? Well, three years. And, you know, I said, well, fill out this provisional ballot. But my takeaway from this is if you're ever asked to fill out a provisional ballot, kiss your ballot goodbye. Yeah. And it was just, you know, very hard to sit there. And then, I mean, i just give one other kind of personal example. So Montgomery County, Maryland, you know, a very progressive county. And, and on election day, it's signs everywhere and vote here and vote aquí and everything. And it was great. Moved to New Haven, Connecticut, my first election there. Uh, the mayor, the 10 term mayor, it was a primary and he was facing a primary. And I, it was quite obvious the Democratic machine didn't want anybody to vote because anybody that was going to be motivated to come out and vote was not going to vote for the incumbent. So we showed up to the New Haven Hall of Records, which was our polling place. 
supposedly opened at 7 o'clock. We got there about 8.30. No signs, nothing. We weren't sure we were in the right place. We walk upstairs, try to open the door. The door was locked. Bang on the door, and some guy came and peered through and said, are you here to vote? I said, well, yes. <laughs> he said, you have to go down there. Well, down there was the basement. So we go to the basement entrance of the New Haven Hall of Records. We go down a winding dark corridor, no signs or anything. We didn't know what we were being led into. And finally get into this little room, which was the polling place. And I really felt um, uh, unnerved by, I mean, it, was obviously, it wasn't voter suppression aimed at me, but it was an effort not to have a fair and open election in the city of New Haven. And, and soon after that, I ran into the, I was introduced to the mayor. And I said, so, Mayor, you know, uh, I'm a constituent, I'm a voter here, and I believe in the secret ballot, but this was a little <laughs> too secret. secret. <laughs> and I explained to him, you know, what my experience had been, and he looked at me for a minute, and he said, huh. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, you're quite right. In fixing little things, you can get to big things. So here's another question. I uh, watch the time here. Okay. You have to be showing you the time right there. Fifteen minutes. Okay, good, because we have good questions. It seems that felon disenfranchisement is the modern equivalent of colorblind barriers to voting, such as the poll tax or literary test. Is changing these laws a state by state effort, or is there space in this constitutional environment for federal policy or litigation to address this problem? I believe there's a cert petition pending. Not Somebody, again. Not not yet, it's litigation. Uh, there, no. here's, here's the interesting thing about offender disenfranchisement and offender reenfranchisement. All of the cases that have been litigated in courts practically, with one exception that I'll mention in a moment, have failed. Uh, either because the Supreme Court has read um, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which nobody reads very often, as affirmatively authorizing disenfranchisement of people for conviction of a crime. Uh, or because courts uh, applying the Voting Rights Act have said you have to show that the criminal justice system is purposefully racist mm -hmm. before you can show that felon disenfranchisement violates the Voting Rights Act. What is so Section 2 of the... It says that um, if... It's the reduction of representation clause. So it says that every state... It, the, the first part of Section 2 of the 14th Amendment overrules Dred Scott as a constitutional matter. and says every state gets the number of representatives that uh, its pop population as a whole, excluding Indians not taxed, uh, equals. Um, but if any state denies someone the uh, denies a male citizen over the age of 21 the right to vote on account of anything other than conviction of crime or participation in rebellion, uh, then you will reduce the number of seats in Congress the state gets by the proportion of people that they've disenfranchised. So it was designed to essentially say to the South after the Civil War, we are uh, giving you, we are counting black people as whole people for purposes of reapportionment. But if you deny them all the right to vote, we're going to take away seats in Congress. So don't think the white people can have seats that are based on the number of black people in the state. Uh, and the Supreme Court said the fact that they say we'll reduce representation except for conviction of a crime means that we are affirmatively allowing you to disenfranchise for commission uh, of a crime. So that's kind of how, how it operates. And the Supreme Court in 1973 in a case called Richardson against Ramirez says that means it's okay for states to have in that case a lifetime ban on uh, felon, uh, uh, felon enfranchisement or offender enfranchisement. Now there have been a couple of successful cases uh, challenging offender uh, disenfranchisement and they've been cases where they're smoking gun that the state picked the crimes because it thought black people commit those crimes more often than others. So there was a case, uh, Hunter against Underwood, that went up to the Supreme Court where Alabama picked various crimes to disenfranchise people for. So they didn't disenfranchise you for, uh, m for manslaughter because they said that was a manly white person's crime. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, that's what they said at the Constitutional Convention in 1901. But How they about did like disenfranchise insider trading? But what? Insider trading. <laughs> 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 but they would disenfranchise you for bigamy because they thought that was like a sneaky black person's crime. This was before Newt Gingrich. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I guess if you do it serially, it's not bigamy, it's serial monogamy. Anyway, so litigation has been remarkably unsuccessful here. What's amazing, though, is the political movements 
to limit or get rid of offender disenfranchisement have been much more successful. And it's a lesson for all of us about movement, which is um, while the Supreme Court was in the process of upholding California's lifetime felon disenfranchisement law, the California voters were repealing uh, that provision and going to one that only disenfranchises people while they're actually serving time. Uh, and so there are a number of ways of going after these laws. I think constitutional litigation is a non-starter. Uh, and I think statutory litigation, and Ryan can speak more to this even than I can, is, is turning out to be a little bit of a dead end. But the political movements to change this uh, are, are very powerful. And here, too, to go back to a point that Nina made earlier, it's important to understand the racialized dimension of this. I went back and looked at the 1870 <laughs> census, and I figured out how many black men the 1870 census enfranchised by figuring out how many black men there were in the United States over the age uh, of 21. And it was about one point something million. That's how many black men are right now disenfranchised by offender disenfranchisement statutes. So all of the progress we had with the 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment has its counterpart with these offender enfranchisement laws. And the minority community understands that, uh, that this is, uh, this is uh, a real problem. Uh, for uh, giving the minority community the, part, the political power that it deserves. And so I think the political process is where we're going to have to fix this. I don't think we're going to fix this uh, through the courts alone. But clearly the, the confluence of these old laws and the mass incarceration crisis is what's created this. And I actually think this is where Pam's earlier point about how courts are mindful of where the American population is on an issue really holds because this really is an issue that, I mean, really needs to be dealt with. To Pam's point, there are better than 5 million Americans who can't vote because of a felony conviction. And given the disproportionate rates of incarceration of people in color, this is really, in, really an avenue through which black and brown political participation has been ravaged. In Alabama, I think one in three black men can't vote because of a felony conviction. And the reality is that neither of the political parties have been great on this issue. Uh, Democrats don't want to touch the issue because they fear that they'd be seen as being soft on crime. Republicans don't really want to touch the issue because they believe that if you allow people with felony convictions to vote, they'd vote for Democrats. And so there's really an opportunity for, you know, for, the, for the, the population to coalesce around the importance of enfranchising people with felony convictions for a host of reasons, the chief of which is that voting really has – there are very credible studies that show that voting is a rehabilitative act, right, that if you give someone a stake in society, they'll feel invested in that society – there's credible studies that show that voting reduces recidivism. And there are places in this country where people vote from prison. Not many, but a couple. Maine and Vermont. I was recently on a train from New York to D.C. and somehow talking about this issue. And I told this fellow who's next to me who was wondering what, what I was reading. It's an interesting phenomenon, being black and reading on a train. <laughs> and this guy, <laughs> this guy said, you know, what are you reading? I told him, we started talking about this very issue. And I said to him, you know, in America, People in Maine and Vermont can cast their ballots from, from prison by absentee ballot. He was like, that makes sense. And I was like, well, why does that make sense? And he was like, I, I just, I, I, small prison populations. But in his mind, he thought the populations there are overwhelmingly white, right? So if I said to him that you could do this in New York, he'd be like, whoa, New York is kind of odd. But the reality is, more broadly, <laughs> most Western democracies allow for people in prison to cast ballots from prison. So this is true in Canada. The European Union and Israel, South Africa. And so this is really an issue where, it, where this country is out of step with respect to how it treats people with felony convictions and respect to voting. I just want to say very quickly, Ted had me put the lower part of my spine in this in a case um, out of Washington State. It was called Farrakhan versus Greg War. It's a case where mm -hmm. we used um, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to challenge the way in which racial discrimination in Washington's criminal justice system uh, shifted into the political process, resulting in the disproportionate denial of voting rights for people with felony convictions who are of color. In Washington State, one in four black men can't vote because of felony conviction. This was a case on behalf of black, uh, blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans. And uh, before the, a three-judge court, three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit, including Judge Reinhardt, we actually won uh, where the court found, right, that Discrimination in the criminal justice system was being shifted into the political process in a way that weakened the opportunity for voters of color to participate in the political process, or denied, disproportionately denied the right of uh, minority voters to participate in the political process. And it was a win for about 
eight months until the Ninth Circuit decided to rehear the case en banc. And the argument was probably like September 22nd. By September 29th, the, 11th, the, the Ninth Circuit had reversed the lower court's ruling 11-0. And cert so, denied, right? Yeah, and cert, and cert, actually, we didn't, we didn't pursue cert. Um. <laughs> you know, one person who should be singled out right now on this issue who should get a lot of credit is the current Republican governor of Virginia. No? Maybe I misunderstood. Okay. So I'll tell you what I understand. Anybody can correct me later. But he's wanted to change Virginia's very restrictive felon disenfranchisement laws. He's got a Republican legislature that won't let him do it. And my understanding, at least, is that he's recently issued executive orders in which he's going to make it easier than his Republican legislature wants him to for uh, convicted felons to be enfranchised. Now, if I have the facts wrong about that, I take back the credit. I'm happy to be <laughs> corrected. Um, but, you know, I, I don't. I don't know that this is going to remain such a polarized issue in partisan terms. Maybe it will, but America's the land of the second chance. And I think lots of people understand that. I think that people from religious backgrounds who are otherwise conservative understand that. So there has been political movement, and it's been governors and legislatures, but even in particular governors. So. We'll see where this goes forward, but I, I agree with what's been said. So we have time, I think, just for one last question, which opens up a new area here. What do you believe will be the outcome of efforts to award electoral votes on a proportional or congressional level basis? So is that an issue that anybody's been looking at? Is, is Lanny in the room? Uh, right, <laughs> Lanny Winnear, where are you? Right. Um, I, I, think, I, I think I think very unlikely. In, 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 in I mean, any, up, in, as I understand the Constitution, it's up to every state. States yes. can decide that they want to do that. Right? Yeah, but it seems vaguely European, and that's the kiss of death. Oh. You know? <laughs> right. Right. 